Katrin is one of the shyest producer DJs I've ever met. Well, not actually met, but you know what I mean. He has some of the most reserved energy I've observed in the genre space he occupies. This obviously has nothing to do with the quality of his output, but as someone who adores his sound, it leaves me wanting to know more about the man who produced hits like 10%, Your Love, and Glowed Up. So without further ado, Here's the story of Kate Trinata. Louis Kevin Celestin, aka Kate Trinata, was born in 92. That's to say, before music internet as you or I know it came into existence. He was born in Haiti, but shortly after, his parents decided it would be best to relocate to Montreal, a scene that Kay would later help put on the map. In the house, Kay's parents played a lot of Haitian music, specifically a subgenre called compa. Compa has similar rhythm structures to reggaeton. If you're familiar, it's that pattern that everyone knows. It's like boom, bada, ba, boom. Keep that handy for later. Kay himself gravitated to artists more like David Guetta, Lauren Wolf, Justice, Mark Ronson, Daft Punk, but most importantly, Madlib. Something to also keep in mind is that Kay was a DJ first, starting at only 14, so a lot of his music is arranged from, well, the mind of a DJ. At 15, his younger brother Louis Felipe, aka Lou Phelps, introduced him to Fruity Loops or FL Studio, it's just a program you could produce music in. Kay uninstalled and reinstalled FL a couple times because it was just so frustrating for someone who came from DJing to learn. But eventually he learned enough from his little brother and YouTube tutorials to kind of make FL his main DAW for the time being. Louis and Kay would mess around in FL all the time, freestyling over their favorite instrumentals like the one for 50 Cent's Candy Shop. They even branded themselves as a hip hop duo by the name of the Celestics with Lou on the mic and Kay on the beats. Kay talks about being around a lot of hip hop growing up because his brother and all his friends were about beats for bars, not necessarily beats for dance. This kind of plays into a little identity struggle that Kay has later on, which we'll get to. His parents were pretty strict and he didn't have a ton of money, so going out to see live producers and DJs that inspired him was kind of out of the question. He had to show his parents the Neptunes documentary three times to get them to understand what he was trying to do. However, Kay's desire to make dance music led him to the Pew Pew music scene at Artbeat Montreal. What is Pew Pew music? Well, Kay even struggles to answer that question, so I'm gonna give you my best shot. Artbeat Montreal was like a safe space for producers and creators alike. Kids would go there and hang out and share beats and production ideas and whatnot, and I think the term Pew Pew more so describe the general interest, vibe, and taste of the people in the scene rather than as a concrete genre classification. It was more like Pew Pew Gang rather than Pew Pew Music specifically, if that makes sense. This is where Kay received the most inspiration, feedback, and support. Artbeat became a second home for him. Pew Pew Beat after Pew Pew Beat and remix after remix uploaded to SoundCloud, Kay finally broke through. He remixed Janet Jackson's If into an ethereal house track. If you're a fan of Kay and you've never heard this before, then you gotta go hear it. It has a Super K 808 pattern, it has a Super K sound selection, and a very K mix decision to use vocals more like another instrumental layer rather than the focus of the track. This remix blew up overnight practically, and for good reason. However, as most creatives are when their work first gets found on a massive scale, K was conflicted. When asked about the overnight success of the remix, his reply was, I didn't expect all this love for one remix. I think I made way more amazing stuff than that. At the time, this was a Alluding to Kay's inner desire to make original work. Sure, the remixes were getting attention, and at this stage in his career, he would probably be foolish to stop feeding the audience the food they already love, right? But something still wasn't right in his heart, and it grew into a bigger, more all-encompassing identity struggle. Kay would go on to release original instrumental singles like At All and Hilarity Duff, but none of them really saw the immediate and viral success that the remix did. People continued to put him in the same box as acts like Disclosure. However, he did manage to get the attention attention of XL Records, which is a massive UK record label that has housed the likes of Adele and Radiohead. This was huge because it meant Kay finally had the opportunity to do what he'd always wanted to do, and that was make an original album of music. It was also at this time that Kay dropped out of high school to start touring as a DJ. He was touring the world as a successful DJ playing his own remixes, sure, but he never got the opportunity to make something of his own from scratch. But the tour money helped out his family so much, it kind of felt like he had no choice but to keep going. And you know, I would keep touring too if Madonna asked me to open for her. According to Kay though, it was at this point that the identity struggle I mentioned earlier was coming to a head. His identity struggle between touring DJ and producer was in fact paralleling one of sexual identity. Still living at home during this time, Kay knew he was bisexual. Quick correction here, Kay did not know that he was bisexual. He knew that he was gay. He told his parents he was bisexual to kind of ease them into the fact that he was actually gay. So if you hear me say bisexual later in the video, I mean gay. Okay, I'm sorry, moving on. 
However, with strict Haitian parents and friends that would toss around homophobic remarks, he was kind of terrified. Just as he walked around as a DJ fronting that he loved to play remixes and other people's music, he'd also walk around fronting that he was straight. Eventually, when the weight of all this became too much, Kay snapped. He recalls this moment where he tells himself to wake the fuck up. In 2015, he told his managers to stop booking shows and returned home. He goes on to explain, I felt like there were two people inside me. I was trying to be someone I was not, and I was frustrated that people didn't know who I was. In fact, that was a quote from a Fader interview that Kay used as a tool to come out to the world. His father didn't even know he was bisexual at the time of that interview, and he was nearly 22 years old. 23, however, marked a year of change, a rebirth, if you will, for Kay. His debut record, 99.9%, .9 carried a lot of the emotional weight that had piled up since the Janet Jackson remix. However, it is without question a beautiful expression of character and soul. Prior to release, Kay remarked, when this album comes out, I swear I'm gonna be everywhere. I'm gonna be not just staying here in this basement making beats all the time. I'll be like a fucking bird from the nest, just fucking flying away to be free. And that's kind of what 99.9 .9 sounds like, the kind of music that you listen to when you decide you're gonna be free and dance it out. Pushed back vocals, warm gooey bass and synths, lush sound selection, incredible sample flips, drums and claps that hit. I can't say enough about how unique this sound was and still is. And if you'll let me, I kind of want to take a pause from Kay's story for a minute to kind of geek on a few things stylistically. Other than the attributes I just mentioned, the one thing that really draws me to Kay's sound is the way he approaches rhythm. Compa, that genre of Haitian music that we mentioned earlier, does a very special thing. Well, special to me as someone who doesn't consume a lot of music in that genre space, where it will fill every rhythmic pocket possible with something. Like there are always different rhythmic motifs happening in different pockets of songs in a way where if you dance to it, you can hop in at any time. There's no way you would lose rhythm to a compa song and there's no way you would lose rhythm to a K Tronata song. Beyond that, K also uses the beat itself as a rhythmic tool. If you're familiar with music production, you know what the word side chaining means, but even if you don't, just stick with me for a minute. Side chaining is basically when you have one plugin in your music making software affecting the sound of something else. But the twist is the way the plugin affects the sound depends on the input you feed it. So producers, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm sure I'm a, a little bit wrong because I don't have a, a great ear for this, but in Kay's case, what he'll do is side chain a good chunk of the beat to the kick with a compressor. What this will do is make the beat itself feel like it's pulsating because every time the kick hits, the whole track will feel like it's getting compressed or a little lower in volume. And that adds another layer of rhythm. Kay is also a huge fan of swing and he's on record saying that he feels like that's the secret sauce that he brings to house music. Swing is basically when you're playing your instrument tastefully off the beat grid, the opposite of playing like a perfect robot exactly on every beat. He recalls a time when Andre 3000 gave him a call to talk about music and he complimented the way that Kay programs drums. Kay loves the way Andre raps because he feels like it has swing and Andre loves Kay's drums because he feels like they have swing. Kay summed it up in an interview by saying, you know, swing recognize swing. You know, if you're a rapper, <laughs> if you're a rapper, you know, like and you like got like this funky like bounce or whatever, like and how you perform it, you know, like Anderson Pack does it like we're definitely gonna click. Andre recognized it, Anderson Pack recognized it, and there's much more as well, you know, Mick Jenkins and my bro as well, Lou Phelps. Again, there are so many rhythmic dimensions to Kay's beats that not even the worst dancer could get lost in them, and I think that's pretty special. Anyway, back to the story. 99.9% .9 in every aspect is a successful release for Kay. No Grammys, but a ton of recognition within Canada, clinching the Polaris Prize for Album of the Year. He made end of year lists for The Guardian, The Independent, NME, Rough Trade, The Skinny, Stereo Gum, Apple Music, and even Pitchfork. His brand of Black Tropical House, as Kay and his brother like to call it, seemed to have landed, and landed really well at that. From here, Kay went on to tour, doing over 120 shows with original material. And as a quiet guy, I'll admit, I don't really have much on him from this point onward. Yes, there were fun EPs and remixes and singles here and there, but on the whole, the story just goes that he was much happier in this time. He moved out, he was touring, life seemed pretty good. Really only two things remain on his mind, and one was kind of figuring out where he fit in as a bisexual man. He raises a good point that before the LGBTQ plus community blossomed on social media to the point where it is now, there was quote, one gay image, and I didn't see myself in that. The other thing on his mind was figuring out where he wanted 
wanted to go next musically. Any artist like Kay with such an identifiable sound has the nagging question, how do I still keep it fresh while recreating the magic? If you recall before, we talked a little about how Kay's identity got tied up in the hip hop his brother and his friends were listening to. And that influence without a doubt made it onto 99.9% .9 with features from Anderson Pack and Goldlink and Vic Mensa dropping bars. But on Bubba, any vocals on that record lean way more R&B than hip hop. And I think that's more K than anything else. And Staying True paid off because that song 10% with Kyle Uchis, it won a Grammy for best dance recording. In fact, the whole album won best dance electronic album for the year of 2021. Now before COVID, K teased a record that sounded like it was gonna be B-sides from Bubba. But for perhaps obvious reasons, that release never happened. Instead, we got another EP called Intimidator. It's just three tracks. And I think the most popular one is the one with her. And that's really great. But something about the French, at least I think it's French, in Pay for Haiti, gets me going. But yeah, unfortunately, that's all I got because every interview after 99.9% .9 covers 99.9% .9 of what I've already talked about. He hasn't been super public about what he's been up to besides DJing a couple parties that happen to have the weekend in attendance. I have a hunch that somewhere on that hard drive of his, he has an EP with Bad Bad Not Good and a few tracks with Pharrell. And I know for sure he has Twin Flame in there with Anderson Pack. But outside of that, I can't predict what he'll do next. And if by the small chance K sees this, he's probably smiling because that's exactly how he wants it. And I'm not saying it should be any other way. I agree. But I don't know, if you want to hit me up to do a little interview, I'll come to LA. I'm kidding. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.